So do you think we're both oversimplifying and oversexualizing Roman culture when we when we engage in, in that kind of interpretive strategy? Yes, a, a, absolutely. I mean, I think the Romans would have been appalled and horrified <laughs> and and also wouldn't have recognized the the Rome of our uh, of our of our imaginings. I mean, the Romans were often prudish. I mean, they they expressed concerns about nudity. Even I mean just things like the orgy for example, which must be the greatest myth uh, ever ever perpetuated about the Romans, you know, yeah, I think well, they would have been shocked to, to think that that's how we imagine they spend their weekends. I mean, it just it just incredible the you know, the evidence for the orgy just isn't there. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing, is you know, argue the most famous thing about Rome just never happened. Mm. <laughs> and and that's, I, I think, a really telling uh, example of just how we've overread uh, Rome and its religious cults and its uh, daily practices. Yeah, as you, as you suggest, uh, Roman and orgy kind of go together like horse and carriage. Yeah, and, and I think the Romans would have been surprised. I mean, the Romans just don't like sharing, for example, just on a basic level. And so, so the idea of sort of this, you know, multiple partners in, in engaged in indiscriminate sexual congress, which has become the, the definition of the orgy from the 18th century onwards, they wouldn't have recognised it. And in fact, I, I must admit, I was surprised when, in doing my research that you'd go to the places where you thought, you genuinely thought you could remember an orgy, and you go and look at this text which you thought you knew really well, and then suddenly you discover that actually it's not an orgy as you as you remember it. So to take the example of the Emperor Caligula, uh, who's famous for his sexual depravity, there's a whole penthouse film about him, etc. And what, what what's extraordinary about him is you go to you know, Suetonius' life, and the most depraved uh, act you can find sexually is him looking at senators' wives o- over dinner. But no orgy erupts. He takes the senator's wife away from the dinner party, and then re- she, they return later, and she's dishevelled, and her hair is ruffled, and he comments on her sexual prowess. But that's not an orgy. It's the fact that they leave the party to indulge in sexual congress that I think is the really telling, uh, really telling moment. Because an orgy, I suppose, would not allow for for power structures to be preserved in ways which I imagine were quite important in the Romans. It was a kind of levelling activity which would bring with it all sorts of, of threats and risks. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing about ancient sexuality is just how status-driven it is. And it's all about, in fact, reaffirming status rather than breaking down status. But the orgy is indiscriminate. I mean, that's the thing about the orgy. I mean, that's what makes it exciting is the indiscriminate uh, plentiful abundance of pleasure. And that, I think, would have been really surprising in the ancient world, because their pleasure is status orientated. You know, how much pleasure, what kind of pleasures you enjoy is totally bound up in what status you you, uh, you possess. So what's happening then in the 18th century to make the orgy come together, as it were, as a, as a sort of phenomenon that then takes hold and, and accretes all these myths and images around it? The orgy goes through a, a series of processes of increasing definition. So that if you look at, for example, the early discussions of the orgy, the orgy, in fact, is mainly used in terms of religious discussion. So it's about it being a Bacchic rite or a pagan rite. And it's it's paganness, which is the, the obscene thing, not its sexuality or, or its kind of wantonness. And what we see in the 18th century is gradually that religious dimension disappears so that people start to imagine orgies with less of the kind of pay, uh, outrage at the paganness and more beginning to uh, feel an outrage at, at the at the sexuality. And there, I think what we're seeing is two things. I think it's that pincer movement I was talking about early, where both the libertines are embracing it so that, for example, if you look at something like the work of Saad, you see that when he starts to use the word orgy, it's really not got any of the kind of religiously pagan aspects. For him, it is, in fact, a sexual party. Whereas before, if you look at, for example, the way in which orgy is used in Protestant preaching, for example, there the the thing is that it's about worshipping a foreign god, not actually. And there's as much kind of concern about the drink as there is about any associations of sex. Uh, So I think it's really the 18th century libertines that make the the, the difference there. And you talk about the bitter seeds of male misogyny being part of this effect. 
That, I think, is the one of the really important things about ancient sexuality is just how male-driven it is. And it's that masculinity, that macho focus on, on only male pleasure and, and you know, deriving what you know, satisfies men as being the kind of important thing that, that becomes almost a tradition into the, the modern world. So, I mean, the seeds of misogyny get planted in the ancient world and bear fruit, I, I think, in... in in constructions of modern sex. Another another very interesting comment in the book for me was you say that the visual rather than the the, the, the written was the sort of primary vehicle for disseminating, vulgarizing, creating these myths of, of ancient sexuality. What, why do you think the visual in particular was was such a potent means? I think that the the visual I think has um, a, a number of important dimensions. I think first of all the visual because it allows you to feed directly into the fantasy life. I think that that's the one one of the important uh, the, the important aspects. I think also the other thing is that one feels the visual having more impact because in some sense it seems to portray things as they were so that when for example Pompeii is excavated you know erotic paintings seem to give you as it were a snapshot of life into to Rome just as similarly uh, erotic vase painting from Athens seems to as it were show what's actually happening in Athens I think it's the conceit of naturalism that that that, that really is is so important there I think also the other thing uh, about it is that with the rise of the printing press and the technology of the dissemination of images that these become almost more important than the text from which they they derive so so that the images particularly you know for example pornographic plates which start their lives as illustrations of texts quickly just get their own kind of life and get disseminated on their own so they kind of leave the text behind and become the image uh, to, uh, you know captivates us and you get a phenomenon of these licentious images accompanied with little classical tags which seem to to validate and legitimize the the whole enterprise and it gives it quite a you know, a spurious but quite a convincing sense of authenticity doesn't it well i think that that's what makes the uh, stories about the ancient world so important is because they come from history and therefore they kind of say that look this happened and not only did it happen and is it possible it could potentially happen again and i think that you know that's what distinguishes historical anecdotes for example from mythological stories or why for example um, erotic uh, plates which depict mythological scenes never seem to be as successful as pornographic plates which depict historical scenes because you know the life of the emperor is something that from which you can base as it were I mean, it has it comes with the kind of authenticity with the with notions of reality and it's the idea that this could really be happening and that you know you too could also be you know Tiberius I think is the is what uh, uh, plays strongly there and once again you've got your pincer movement because you've got the moralists who can castigate the emperor and you've got the libertines who can sort of revel in the licentiousness exactly and i think also the other thing about this is that because it's uh, it's about stories about emperors it's a way of giving yourself some power because you can use it politically you can say to for example uh, emperor current emperors or indeed kings and monarchs you know, later on you know get told look the last thing you want to do is be remembered as tiberius or as caligula so you know moralists can use them to increase their own prestige and use them for their own political purposes so um so that's one of the things that i think these stories do alistair blanchard we were talking about his recent book, Sex, Vice and Love from Antiquity to Modernity, which is out now. You can find out more about the book by going to blackwell.co.uk. In part two of this interview, available very soon, you can hear the conclusion of our discussion, in which the focus switches to Greece and Greek love. For the moment, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.